If you like what you're hearing on the phillytech.org netcast network, please consider supporting the network with a small monthly donation via patreon.com slash phillytechorg. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash p-h-i-l-l-y-t-e-c-h-o-r-g. And thank you in advance. You're listening to the Social Media Addicts Podcast on the phillytech.org netcast network. Sponsorship provided by Get Flywheel, optimized WordPress hosting at getflywheel.com, wistia.com at w-i-s-t-i-a.com, and Zoho Mail. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 20 of the Social Media Addicts Podcast. I'm Seth, that's Jody, and that's Howard, and welcome to our big number 20 episode, 20th it's episode. It's number 20! Number 20. What, what say you, Jody? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Happy 20. Happy 20. Exactly. 20 is like the when you're doing podcasting 20 is like the number that's like it's the equivalent of, of it's like we've been dating for 6 weeks. It's like one of those kinds of numbers where you know we haven't had a year, we haven't had a you know 50th or 100th episode it's like 20. It's like, "Oh, look at that. The baby's celebrating its 10 week birthday." Oh god. Okay. So, that's what 20 is like, but still, let's celebrate. Hooray. I've got tea. As a you say the Chaim. Anyhow, let's get on with the show. Let's see what we got here. So f- before we get started, actually, um, if everyone could go to patreon.com slash phillytechorg, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash phillytechorg, and give what you can, help us support the network, help us grow the network. We have some great shows coming up. Howard and I are doing the Intergalactic Mobile OS podcast. Um, there is a, we are doing an Autism and Tech podcast. There's a bunch of podcasts. Coming up there, Jody's going to do a Gadget Dogs podcast at some point. You know, when she's not going to dog shows, she'll get on, she'll start putting together those shows for us. So if you want to see these shows come to fruition, you, can, you know, throw us a few bucks. It's the value for value model. So if you can give a little bit, that would be very helpful. So thank you. And onward and upward. So YouTube, who 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 loves YouTube here? I like YouTube. Jody. Oh, I love YouTube. <laughs> and I will admit that quiet. YouTube does. Um, my, both of my children do like YouTube. Now my uh, uh, teenager is perfectly content watching YouTube unfettered. Um, my now there's, now there's a now there's a YouTube show for children. There is a YouTube for children app, and my ten year old would probably be pretty upset if I make her go back to that. And I don't think it's quite targeted at a ten year old. I think it is targeted for that uh, younger kid. Uh, yeah. But yes, YouTube has launched a uh, a nice. A mobile app. It's actually uh, the story initially that we were looking at said that it was going to be for Android first and iOS would come later, but iOS was available on launch day, which I think is uh, pretty right, great. Cool. That's really cool. Well, I, I tested it. Um, a lot of you can still kind of get some um, bootleg copies of shows. Is, I think what they're doing is that they're, they're saying they're curating it based on content. Like, is this appropriate for this age group? And not but in order to keep the safe harbor, they're not moderating. Like, is this legal? Is this legal content or not? They're just sort of doing what they do with YouTube proper, where they say, "We're just putting the platform out there." Well, and we'll again, it, it's well. the same thing. Google does this with almost every single one of their products. Mm-hmm. It's curation by algorithm. We're going to come up with a formula that's going to figure out and detect all the things that say whether something's good or not. Because it's that, or they have to throw a ton of staff in order to do that curation. And they uh, actually the curation on YouTube, on YouTube, it turns out there is a staff behind this. They are curating it somewhat now. They're curating the content. They're not curating whether or not it's legal content or not. Right. But they're making sure that like you know something racy doesn't get in there. A Fifty Shades of Grey trailer doesn't end up in the YouTube app. YouTube well, for children. Exactly, and they're basically doing some of the safety controls that are on that were on YouTube already. Just by packaging it at this kids app is it's a really nice way to kind of give you a nice presentation. Um, 
it's almost like you can hand the phone to the kid and say, here, watch YouTube, and know that they're pretty much from that mobile app. They're going to be okay to go. Yeah, and you can even adjust it based to give the parental controls. You can say only look at the feed. You can say just look at You can search a little bit. You can do a bunch of different things within the app. Jody, you've been very quiet. Obviously, trying to keep your dogs quiet as well. But, um, well, yeah, I've got, I've got it on mute because I keep barking. But um, I appreciate your bringing me in. Um, you both have young children, so I guess it would be something that would be more appropriate for, for both of you. My daughter, I mean, she probably watches stuff that I'd be shocked to watch. So, <laughs> you know, my kids are older. Um, but I think, I think it's interesting because I think it now gives them a platform. It gives Google a platform. Um, and advertisers a platform to appeal to a younger demographic. Mm -hmm. So, but would either of you have any qualms about letting your kids watch it? No, I actually my my one kid's two years old. I mean, he's not really watching YouTube per se. He'll watch something that I put on for him, but he's not exactly really watching YouTube. So, what about you, Howard? Well, you, both you, my kids control kids. their own destiny at this point. They uh, they choose what they want to watch when they want to watch it. And the part that I've always tried to do is teach them what are what's appropriate and what's not. Um, I think if I had had this app five years ago, I would have absolutely, um, I don't want to say insisted, that my then would have been five-year-old daughter, absolutely perfect for her. I did check it out. I did look through some stuff. I like what they're doing. Um, I think it's a good thing uh, for parents who aren't as tech savvy to have sort of a one-app way of giving their kids their phone and saying, go ahead and watch. Um, you know, we can put them in front of the TV or we can put them in front of YouTube, and largely the kids don't care. It's a screen. Yeah, pretty much. So let's move on with another YouTube story. YouTube is tightening the rules for brand-sponsored videos. Sponsored brand logos and products are prohibited on graphical video overlays unless the sponsor has a deal, ad deal with Google. That's kind of a little icky in my opinion, but... Um, I mean, according to the article on Marketing Land, YouTube says it regularly sends checks to 15 million creators, par creator partners, sharing the wealth from the network's rapid growth, a 50% year-over-year increase in viewership for the last three years. So they obviously want the ads to be funneled through them and not being go going, you putting an overlay in your, ad, in your video, you know, saying, here's our sponsors. I mean, I'm kind of interesting how this actually... We're not really doing overlays per se. We're doing screen shares. I'm not sure. Wait, wait, let's see you guys. Well, it seems to me that what they're kind of doing is they're eating into the profits for the creators. Um, in other mm -hmm. words, if, if a creator has their own um, relationship, it, it may be in conflict with what Google is trying to do. Um, I, I mean, it, look, we're playing on their platform. We're playing by their rules, so they get the opportunity to write what, what they want. What do you yes. think? <laughs> Howard, what say you? Well, I think what's interesting, if I, if I look at these rules from a straight user experience what? sort of hat and put that on and say, okay, user experience hat, um, what happens when a great big ad that's graphic shows up in one corner of the video and then another ad shows up in the bottom you have something that's very disjointed because those ads are going to be different. One of them is going to be the um, in-video ad by someone putting up a great big sponsor you know, logo, and the other is going to be another sponsor logo at the bottom. It looks really junky, and I've seen videos like that, and I'm like, man, there's a lot of ads on YouTube. And mm -hmm. then you think, oh, well, what about the content creators that either turn off monetization on YouTube and they have their own ad deals and they put their own ad links and do all that in line. Those videos look wonderful. There's no uh, pre-roll, there's no you know overlay ads, it's just saying look it's a video platform and there's links in the videos to their sponsors or the people that you know basically turn on monetization and their videos are clean. There's no um, big logos or Google um, or excuse me uh, uh, big cards that say this has been brought to you by Squarespace, for example, or Wistia, or whatever the platforms are, um, a great big sponsor logo in the middle of the video kind of gets confusing. And I kind of think about it this way. It is YouTube's playground. They can set the rules, and technically the advertisers are double dipping, and YouTube's just saying no double dipping. Yeah, so I think all three of us agree on that. Um, I, I, we are in their playground. 
ultimately, and that's the way it is. Speaking of Wistia, let's thank Wistia, our sponsor. Hold on, let me get to this, share the screen. <laughs> We're still working on the actual making it work properly here. Exactly. So Wistia, tell us about Wistia, Howard. Well, today's show, we have to thank our sponsor, Wistia. Wistia is a video hosting and analytics platform that helps businesses get the most out of video online. We would you we actually use Wistia here at phillytech.org. It's a much more professional option than YouTube, as we were just talking about. And the data that Wistia provides us really helps us understand how our content is being consumed. And the other part is Wistia has lots of resources on their site to help those of us that are getting started with video. Um, tutorials on lighting and editing, choosing the right microphone, all kinds of things like that through a community that's dedicated to helping each other have better videos. And they also have a free version of their service that can hold up to 50 videos. So go check them out at wistia.com. That's W-I-S-T-I-A dot com. The product is great. The resources are super duper helpful. And the team is really full of good people. So please go visit Wistia and uh, go to our website at phillytech.org and click on the Wistia link there to make sure that you are getting, uh, that they know that uh, we sent you. Absolutely. And onward and upward. <laughs> um, so Twitter. There's, there's a dilemma with Twitter. Twitter is, is trying to balance its users and its and making money at the same time, and they're having some trouble, you know, with doing this. I mean, they've added some new features into it. They've added in, they've added in the direct the direct messages, the the DMs where you can DM multiple people at the same time, which I think is very neat. They added in videos and whatnot, but but um, overall, they're trying to add in features, but they're also trying to grow, put in growth. So and grow their company, grow the, the valuation of their company as well, being a public company. So what do you think, guys? What do you think, Jody? Um, what, I is think, the, what is the Twitter dilemma? Well, I think Twitter has many dilemmas, but not mm -hmm. not one of the things that I feel is not a dilemma for Twitter is that if you are seeking information um, real time, um, particularly for um, crisis management or crisis communications. You cannot beat Twitter. Case in point, today there was an incident where a house exploded. Um, I don't know if you saw it out in Stafford Township in New Jersey. Um, saw it immediately on Twitter, watched it as it happened, um, was able to inform our reliability and security team and get them mobilized. But the information came in through Twitter much faster than any of the networks. Mm -hmm. I see it on Twitter and then um, you know, a few minutes later I'll get an alert on my phone that, that something is happening. So I think one of the things that Twitter needs to do is recognize what Twitter is excellent for and what Twitter is not good for. Twitter is not good for curated news. Twitter is good for um, mass information bubbling up from, from the audiences. Um, mm -hmm. I don't feel that it's necessarily necessarily a dilemma, but I think it's a function of recognizing where their strengths are and not trying to change Twitter to be more like Facebook. I hate the concept of group DMs. Absolutely oh. abhor it. Hate it. Hate it. Oh, because, I'm sorry. I was, I'm sorry. I was. I was well, DMing and, and, but I'll tell you why I hate it. I hate it because to me the idea of a direct message is that it should be personal between two people. It shouldn't be something that's broadcast. And I resent it when I get um, broadcast messages like that on Facebook. And I, I think it, I hate the, the fact that it's now being done on Twitter. I, I just think it totally depersonalizes the experience. But anyway, well, mental, mental note, don't send Jerry a... Please don't. A DM. <laughs> I just thought it was more efficient to DM you and Howard at the same time, but you know. Well, well, that's that's only two people. That's not like a group. You know what I mean? No, I, no, I think yeah. technically. I, I think within reason, it's not a bad idea. Like if I wanted to talk to the two of you and have a little three-person conversation or four-person conversation, mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. But I mean, if you're if you're DMing like fifteen people, that's a little ridiculous. right. But to Jody's point, where do you draw the line? I mean, if I can add twenty people on a group message. I'm basically opting 19 other people into a conversation that's interrupting them, and they have to like desperately try to leave. On Facebook, it's bad enough when people do it. So adding it to Twitter, it's almost like if you want to have a group DM, um, 
I wish there was sort of like no more than five. If they made it no more than five, at least it's sort of used for a small conversation, like, hey, we got to loop in a couple of people. But um, I can totally see people for. abusing this. Uh, true, but, you know, Twitter is an advanced form of communication. So it is, you know, it's something where it's, a, it's the next step beyond email. It's one of those things. Um, there's, also group, there's also group me and WhatsApp and all these other apps out there for that. You don't need yeah. that. But you know what? It's interesting, Howard, because I don't see Twitter as being an advanced form of communication. I see Twitter as being more of a base form of communication. So, you know, like, it, it, there should be no overlay. There should be no whistles and bells. It is raw. It is um, information that's, that's shared immediately from multiple sources, and it's up to us as the users of information to cultivate and kind of distill and figure out what's what, what what we will allow to bubble up to the top. But I don't see it as being a filtered service, and I don't want it to be a filtered service because that, for me, I, I defeats Howard their advantage. That. What's yeah. that? I think Howard's agreeing. Uh, oh, I definitely agree with you. Um, one of the things I actually... Uh, I, I did a course a whole bunch of years ago because people were saying, what is Twitter? So I wrote a, a little teaching course called What in the Heck is Twitter? And what I taught people, and this was back in like 2007, 2008, was Twitter is more like a communications protocol than it is a website. So back in 2008 through 2010, Twitter had all these infrastructure problems. Oh and what was talked about was how did they get over this centralized server? And so, you know, there were myself and lots of other people were proponents of federating the service the same way that email is effectively a federated protocol. There are email servers all over the planet, and it passes communications from one server to the next. And if Twitter was sort of thought of that same way, well, they probably wouldn't have the dilemma of how do we sell ads because Twitter wouldn't be a website, it would be a protocol. And I think if it were a protocol, we would use it a whole lot more because it would be, as Jody describes, is that base level of communication. This is just information. It's sort of like that raw stream of news of uh, things bubbling up, trending topics. It's a really effective platform that way. So the monetization is where it gets a little weird. Yes, I agree with that. But, I mean, people have tried it. Like App.net has tried to do it. And other you know versions of Twitter of the microblogging platforms have sprouted. Some still use app.net. I don't. But people go where their friends are, and ultimately, the friends are on Twitter. So without Twitter being federated, and not the public company, so it's not going to be federated, you know, you're not going to really be able to get that full unfettered, you know, experience because it never became federated. But there have been other attempts to make a federated Twitter-like service out there, status net, and others out there, but they never really talk for some strange reason. So, I, mean, I've, I've, I have an account in every single one of them. Well, but if you and think about the get Jody admin... on it. I mean, I try to get Jody on it, and she's like, why? You're there. I can talk to you on email. Well, think so. about it this way. If you look at the advent of email and its uptake, and you were to say, well, email was a base-level protocol that literally took 20 years before people even noticed that it was important. And then the next 10 years where people started to say, okay, it's important, and now we're 40 years past that original email protocol as it, the way it's defined, and now it's an everyday kind of thing. Twitter isn't that old. It's not even a decade old. So yeah. its chance to effect effectively integrate across all these platforms, it's still, you know, it's very young in uh, technology. Yeah, but it's not gonna, it's, it, Twitter itself is never going to become a protocal. Because well, of course not, because they're a public email. company. Exactly. Email was never a public company. There was Google that had their email service. There was all these hosting companies that had their email service. There needs to be a Twitter that everyone uses that is is ubiquitous. There's right. Not, communication. Not email. It's not. It's not an email. It's it's a, it's a communication tool. Right, See, but I mean, think back. And to honestly, the... that's it all picked up. Think, think about the early days of email where you had your CompuServe and your Prodigy and your AOL where you had sort of closed networks that had to talk to each other um, as opposed to just being sort of unfettered communications. It took mm -hmm. people saying this is more valuable as an unfettered communication service than as these little uh, closed uh, fiefdoms, so to speak, uh, where you yeah. have your AOL users or your... Uh, CompuServe users, which uh, hey, yeah, but, but, but the communication is different. In an email, you're sending it to 
a person, whether you're doing it as a blast or as an email, you're directing it to an entity. Twitter is not directed to any generally, okay, a general tweet. General. It's not directed to a particular person, right? I mean, it's, it's basically a public broadcast. You don't email a public broadcast. Different. It is two separate things. I mean, it's, it's hard to see. It's hard to see them being. You can't really compare apples and oranges, but it would be nice if we could get a Twitter esque service out that would work as a as an unbridled, unfettered resource for people. But no one, no one's take, taken to it. So yeah, no let's well, maybe we need to resuscitate Plurk. Oh God, Plurk! Oh, I hate Plurk. Plurk was like a it wasn't it wasn't a horizontal. I, I, what was Plurk? I don't know what Pounce was. Just, Pounce was just cool. go back, look in the Wayback Machine, look at what Plurk was. That's everyone's fun for the day. Oh, well, that's your that's your homework assignment, everybody. Anyhow, speaking so Joe, we all have established that Jody does not like the the mass DMs. What do you think about the Twitter videos? And do you think the Twitter will win the video war of the micro videos? What say you, Jody? I think it's genius. I think it absolutely has a place. I think it goes back to the concept of seeing something in real time. Did you catch the video of the house exploding the today? No, I didn't. Somebody got had a dash cam, and they actually caught when this house, I mean, literally, this house disintegrated. It blew up. I mean, it, crazy, crazy stuff. I think that for news media, for, for things that are real-time, you remember the one of the meteor that, in Russia that fell across the road mm -hmm. and somebody had a dash cam? That is the brilliant use of Twitter for streaming this kind of information, real-time, real communication. You know, more, more eyes on the world <coughs> right now than ever before. And you think about it, if we had had um, this kind of a service, like a video Twitter service, when there was the Kennedy assassination, there would be no Magruder film. It would be a bazillion Magruder films, and we would probably know exactly what happened. So I think it's evolved into um, an information source, and I think it definitely is, is going to be a power player. What do you oh think, Howard? Oh, my God. Howard? I'm looking at the video right now. Holy crap. Right? Oh, my God. Screen share it. I'm go oh my god, it's, 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 like, it's like a giant firework. It was cra the house is disintegrated. 75 homes were evacuated. Was it a gas leak? Yes. Oh my god, look at you that. You got it after it already started. Yeah, you got to start at the beginning. It's just like a regular street and then all of a sudden... It's a buoy. Wait, look at that. Insane. Oh my god. But it's not this. It's not a special effect. It's real. It's gonna anyone die? I don't know what the stats are. I haven't watched it since this afternoon. At that point, I think there were 15 people that were injured. I think there were at least a couple that were critically injured. I don't know if anyone was in the house. Oh, I hope not. If they were, they you know, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. I didn't hear any of that. All right, onward to. Um... Let's well, maybe Howard it. wanted to weigh in. Yeah, Howard, let's say you. The only thing I wanted to add about Twitter video is I actually, um, I hope that it wins because um, lots of these other different services, I think they are cute, but I don't think they have staying power. And, it, you know, Twitter seems poised to be one of the ones that has uh, real staying power to it. It's very simple to use. Um, it's predictable. It kind of works the way you want it to work. And if you're an advertiser or a brand, it's a natural fit. So I hope that it's the one that wins so that you don't have to be spread out across ten different short video platforms. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, two things on that. They own, they, they own Vine, which is six seconds. They're going up against, they're going up against uh, Instagram, which is 15 seconds. So 30 seconds, I think, is just enough time to really get a good message out. Another thing is, is that it pulls people back to their app. See, I use Falcon Pro on my, all my devices. I use Hootsuite for on the computer. But in order to use the Twitter video, I have to use, have the Twitter app on my phone to use that feature. So it gets me to use their 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 app. I think it's brilliant for that matter alone. It's getting people to at least have that installed on their on their device to use it. So that's what I think. Let's thank our next sponsor. Flywheel. Our next sponsor, 
Oh, Are you ready, Seth? Because our really next sponsor ready. is Flywheel. And Flywheel is a managed WordPress hosting platform. And it's built specifically for designers and creative agencies. So Flywheel makes it really simple to build, launch, and manage your client sites with its easy-to-use dashboard that they built designed for a modern web designer. They do nightly backups. Their load times are super-duper fast. Their security is designed for WordPress. And they have a really great support team that's full of WordPress developers so that when you actually have a problem with your site, they can help you as opposed to saying, well, your server is configured properly, the way most shared hosting providers do it. Um, and they help designers all around the world, help them launch their projects, really make WordPress, uh, a managed WordPress environment, a great environment to work with. So again, that's Flywheel. And, you'll wanna, and their website is getflywheel.com. And please go to our website, phillytech.org, and click on the Flywheel uh, ads there so that they know you are coming from phillytech.org. Yes, and I'd like to add one thing. that We are hosted by them, so we thank them for hosting our site, so thank you very much. And I, I actually use them for all my clients' websites as well, so I'm the, they're hands down the best WordPress hosting site out there. And no, I'm not just biased. I'm actually speaking, speaking from experience, so... Check them out, getflywheel.com. Next story. Why Facebook is going to be the next Procter & Gamble of social media. I thought, this is a, I thought this was a funny article, but it's kind of true. Yeah, this is a really yeah, interesting exactly. story. Um, and it's actually, uh, in thinking about it in this context, when they bought Instagram, the first thing I said was, oh, great, they're going to basically crap up Instagram and integrate it into the experience and I kept waiting for them to integrate Instagram into Facebook and they haven't done it. They've made it a little bit easier for you to find your friends and when you post the integration from a technical standpoint works very very smoothly like if you want to cross post from Instagram to Facebook really really easy but it still links you back to Instagram so you still have to like, if someone wants to, you know, friend you on Instagram, you still have to do that. Yes, they're already your Facebook friends and easy to find, but it's its own thing, and that has got me puzzled. And so looking at it in this context, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm compelled by this article. What say you, Jody? Sorry, I was on mute because of the dogs. I think it's a cute spin to the article. I see... <laughs> Totally, completely different marketing strategies, but I like the fact that they stretch to try to pull the two together. It, um, Procter & Gamble has been a master at running multiple little brands, okay? They, they, every time they, they come up with another idea, they spin it off almost as if it's its own product. I don't see Facebook as taking that kind of approach. I see them almost going the opposite direction by pulling things into Facebook as being the Facebook brand. That's just my two cents. Yeah, you know, I, I get where you're coming from from that. I mean, I, I did also see that Facebook is not pulling in, it is not pulling in Instagram directly into Facebook as a possible start of different silos that they're using versus pulling them in, making them all one thing. Um, I think this might have started uh, when they when they took over friend feed. They kind of left it to die, but they also left it out there for people to keep on using. Which is what I, which I really think is valuable. It's because you know, if friend feed's still out there. If you want to use friend feed, it's out there, and able to use. It's just no one's there anymore because it's not being supported. But they they have been known to say we're not going to absorb. Like Google takes on companies and just absorbs them, and that's it. They do acu hires and they hire the companies and they just destroy the products a lot of times. Facebook hasn't done that, so I mean, I do see there is a parallel between between Facebook and Procter Gamble. Maybe if, maybe it's a reach. But it's definitely there. Definitely is a little bit of a um, similarity in, in a long stretch of the word. Right, and one of the points that uh, I think is really interesting is Facebook can, at a very very low cost, support lots of organizations like Instagram and WhatsApp just from straight server WhatsApp firepower. Is the other one, yeah. And that kind of server firepower is expensive. And if you have a startup that starts to get really popular, think about Ello. Ello can't compete with Facebook because they can't afford servers. So they don't let oh, people into the service. Well, it does stink, but they couldn't even, when all there was all this media hype and people wanted to get in, nobody could get in. 
because they were crashed. Their servers were just crushed. I mean, they were basically running a $10 a month shared hosting account, um, not even that. Uh, and they just couldn't handle the bandwidth. If they had had Facebook as their bandwidth behind them, well, that gives yeah. Instagram a really significant competitive advantage. Same thing with the server technologies that they've developed. So now WhatsApp can be even more competitive in other countries using Facebook's infrastructure and uh, tools like that. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing sure. where a startup that's in the messaging space has to get their infrastructure from somewhere. So when Facebook buys them and says, we got it covered for you, don't worry about it. That's a really big competitive thing. That's actually what Procter & Gamble does when it absorbs a brand. It says, we've got this distribution channel. We have these deals. We have production. We have packaging here. So now that brand, you know, that the cost of running that brand goes way, way down. So now they're very, very competitive. Absolutely. Absolutely. How many of you guys use, uh, now for something completely different, uh, <laughs> How many of you guys use LinkedIn on a regular basis? I mean, I do. Um, Howard? I'm raising my hand. Jay's shaking her head. Oh, absolutely. Quietly. You have to. You have to. So what, what's your thought on them them pushing more ads and pushing more you know, content, you know, trying to make money off their service? <laughs> what is your thought on this article? Anybody? Go ahead, Howard. <laughs> I think um, they've always been doing this. This is one of those things where they're trying to make their ad platform better. Um, you've always That's had the ability sense. to opt yourself out of uh, how things are tracked and opt yourself in. Um, it's something where you go into your settings and you can turn off how stuff is tracked about you. Uh, they've had that since basically since they started showing ads on their site. Um, even when they give, quote, data away to get better business-to-business -business ads or however they want to describe uh, enhancing these ads, they still aren't providing my data. They aren't saying to their advertiser, this is Howard, you can have him. What they're doing is they're providing the same way Facebook has its ad platform where you say, I'm looking for people in this demographic that have this kind of education, that have this kind of thing, to show them ads. It gives them better targeting, but it's not necessarily saying, you get Howard. Now, when I click on something, they're going to know Howard is someone with this kind of education because that's where they targeted their ad to or this kind of job position or things like that. Um, I think it's a really good play. Uh, the data that we put in LinkedIn benefits people, whether they have a free account or a paid account, way more than uh, necessarily than the ads could be intrusive. I think it's a good, like, we both get a lot out of it and it's worth it. So whether you have a paid account or a free account. Uh, I don't feel violated, so to speak, by this. Violet, what, what say you, Jody? Um, I think that we've seen more and more advertising recently on LinkedIn, more so than ever before. Yes. But what I like about the way that they've done it is that it seems to be kind of a natural, um, you know, progression in terms of the the ads that they show. Um, I don't feel that it's glaring. I don't think that it's violating my privacy and it, at, if it gets to a point where I do feel it's violating my privacy I may rethink why I'm on LinkedIn but currently sorry about that that's a, a dog destroying something in the background um, <laughs> hi Ruger <laughs> that is Ruger good good you knew which one it was um, but but I guess um, you know they're, they're I think my impression is at least that they're walking a very fine line between the advertising being in your face versus having it be supportive of what you're looking for versus not glaringly in your face. And I think so far it's not bothering me. Um, I will continue to use LinkedIn. If it gets to a point where I fear, feel that it's obnoxious or I feel like my privacy has been violated, I'm gone. Absolutely. It's a fine line. Honestly, I find that if the ad's a good ad and it's valuable, I don't care that there's an ad there. If it's helpful to me, I learn about a new product, Sure, but give me an ad. I don't mind supporting the network. I'll click on the ad. You know, I've even found, God forbid, I've actually found some good ads on Facebook even where I've, I've looked the apps. They have these apps, these Android apps, or at least for me, for Android apps. And there's an Android user, so it says, these are some great apps. I found like two or three good apps in the past two weeks that I'm now using regularly versus apps that I find on my own that I might use for a day and forget about. Facebook actually has been very good about their ads lately. Not in the sidebar, but in, in the feed. 
So, I mean, if LinkedIn can provide me a good, you know, ad t- targeted ads to something that I'd be interested in, bring it. Seriously. Yes. It's a good point that you raise, though, Seth, because sometimes when I go into Facebook, I feel like my whole stream is no longer my friends. It is now all business brand promotions. Mm-hmm. And it frustrates me. I don't necessarily want to see. I'd like to see some of my friends' stuff at least. What do you, Howard, do you, are you noticing that as well? I've actually, uh, for me, Facebook ads have been pretty good. Um, every so often there's something that I look at and I go, mm, that's not for me. And I've been pretty diligent early on that when I see an ad that's not appropriate, I click the little thing that says why. Like they have a little thing saying don't show this ad and give it a couple reasons why. I'm that guy who takes the extra 10 seconds to Dork. do that step. Most people don't do that and I don't encourage people to do that. But it is there and I've actually noticed that my ad experience on Facebook has been pretty good. Um, so I don't hate them as much. I don't feel like, oh, they're, they're really in the way. And so I agree with you, Seth, that when LinkedIn shows ads and the more they get relevant, I'm not going to hate it. It's the, it's the irrelevant ad that bugs me, not the relevant. I'm, I'm not even talking about the ads, though. I'm talking about in the stream. This is too many ads, you're saying. Yeah, it's a lot more than it used to be. And sometimes I'll go in and it's like the, the whole stream just seems to be brand pages as opposed to individuals. You know what that, you know what that is? It's probably because you like those brands and then they're boosting those posts and then they're probably. making sure they show up. That's what it is. I it, should stop a, liking it, my friends' brands then. Is that yeah, the maybe. idea? <laughs> exactly. So have, now for something completely, completely, completely different. Um, have you guys ever heard of the, of the polling site Polar? It was it was recently so quote unquote bought by Google. Turns out it, and it shut down as I say that Google likes to do. But it turns out that um, Polar was not shut down. It, it wasn't even acquired by Google, but the the higher, the company the people at, at Polar were hired away, and then the investors took it o- over Polar and now are now running it again. For those who are not familiar, Polar is a free polling app slash site that allows you to. Um, do surveys online. It's a neat little service, but um, it's still out there. So if you want to check it out, go check it out. What do you guys think? I think um, it's it's pretty cool. It's kind of like um, the other eleven apps that we posted about that you don't even <laughs> know are existent in Google. I thought that was a, a pretty cool cool summary of articles. Did you get a chance to? Um... We're actually going to get into that next. Howard, what say you about Polar or anything? Um. Yeah, it's a cute little platform. I've always done surveys directly on the sites. Like when I build a site for a client or I'm doing my own stuff, I try to keep the data as my own data. Um, so I'm not a big fan of a lot of the different polling sites. But it's a classic Silicon Valley aqua hire. I'm glad that the investors said, okay, so you got our people. Well, we already have value in the company, so take our people. We'll hire new people and keep it going. Um, mm-hmm. If Google let them do that and said, hey, we're not actually buying Polar, we're just buying the people, then I'm glad that it's resurfacing and you know that the uh, mm-hmm. the investors are, aren't going to be out of luck from their uh, original investment. I honestly don't think that um, the investors would be out of luck if, if Google bought Polar and bought the IP, the investors would still make out pretty darn good, but you know. But they're, they're obviously, they believe in their product, and that's a great thing. Let's go on to what Jody was talking about, which was, did you know there's 11 apps that you probably did not know existed in Google? One of which is not Polar, but we have, to list them real fast, we have Sound Search, which is sort of like Spotify, not Spotify, it's sort of like... Um, Shazam! Shazam, thank you. Um, then, then there's Primer, which is essentially a way to... What is Primer, Jody? It's... Um... A mar- marketing um, app that teaches entrepreneurs marketing um, strategies. Hmm, Big picture actually, strategies. I'm actually download that. I, just, I opened up another window to download that. I think it. I think it. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. And then there's the yeah, Google, Google Authenticator. Google. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there, I've, I mean actually stopped, some... I've actually stopped using that. I've actually stopped using that. I've actually used a, a little app called Authy. Which does cool. the same thing, only it's a little prettier and syncs across devices. Then you've got the gesture search, which we can't use on the iPhone. Right. Well, I can't I'm a big. I have to tell you, I'm a huge fan of Google Authenticator. I have tons and tons of sites using it. Any place that I can use two factor and I can use Google Authenticator, I'm a I'm a big fan. So try out try out Authy, Howard, at some point because Authy uses the same two factor authentication, but it's 
but it um, keeps it synced amongst your devices. So if you lose your device and you have to format your device, it's stored somewhere for you. Another option. All right, I'll give it a look. Um, also, Google Opinion Rewards. I love this. They asked me, hey, have you been to a Mazda dealership in the last week? And I'm like, no. And they're like, here's a dollar on the Google App Store. <laughs> like, yeah, but that's, like, that's only on Android. You can't get that on. Yeah, but why would you? Yeah, exactly. But I love it because I've actually actually saved up five dollars and and bought another bought an bought yourself a cup of coffee. <laughs> Seriously, then they have Google Classroom where you can like do flashcards, and then of course there's Field Trip, which is great unless it almost causes you to do an have an accident if it starts talking to you randomly. I, I like Field driving. Trip, I, but I don't. You know, I mean, I, I like it and I don't like it. Um, it depends I, at times. Uh, well, sometimes it just doesn't seem to have any good information. So. Yeah, it's, sometimes it's sort of like that is an old house. I'm like, yes, it you. is. <laughs> then there's then, of course Ingress, which is a very, very cool app if you have time to play with it. It's like a real world immersive um, game, and that can be a justice. But there's people who are really into Ingress, and there's people that tried it like I did and just kind of let it go. And there's then there's a big web quiz for Chromecast. Have you, you tried that? It. No, I'm. I want to try it. Another one I'm going to download. Then there's also um, Intersection. Intersection was both really neat as well. Yeah. So there's some neat ones. There's some neat... Yeah. Do I... I'll have to check those guys out. I'll report back next week. Maybe one of them will be my pick. <laughs> yeah, Speaking, of which... next... Speaking of which... We're not on our picks yet, Joe. You're jumping the gun. We have one more sponsor that to thank. Zoho Mail. Yes, this week's uh, third sponsor is Zoho Mail, and we would love to sponsor, uh, excuse me, <laughs> ad read, <clears throat> ad read, Zoho Mail. So we would like to, <laughs> to thank our sponsor. Man, it's getting late at night. Let's try that the third time. And scene. Phillytech.org would like to thank our sponsor, Zoho Mail. It is professional email designed for the business with business class features and security as well as the convenience of web and mobile. So learn more about Zoho Mail and sign up for a free ad-free account for up to 10 users by clicking on our link in the show notes or on our website. And again, thank you to Zoho Mail. Um, our mail through phillytech.org is also through Zoho Mail, and it is a great service. It works very, very nicely. Yeah, we love them. Thank you, Zoho Mail. Now, Jody, where, where, where are we going now? The picks of the week. That's and so right. Uh, since Jody's so excited to go talk about her pick, let's let Jody go first. You want me to go Jody? first? Yeah, because you were so excited. You're, you're about to cut off a sponsor to talk about your pick. Oh, no, no, no. I just I forgot about the sponsor. I, I mean, I didn't oh, forget about it, means. but I... What yeah. is what has been verified? All right, so I've been using this app for a while now. Um, let's say that, um, first of all, you want to check what is out there about yourself. Um, in terms of whether there's any um, derogatory information, um, public records, um, you know, anything that's been filed against you, been verified, you can check yourself or you can check somebody else. Um, basically, what it does is it goes through a bunch of different sources and it comes back and it tells you if the person has a record, um, what the record, what the offenses were. Um, it also does property search. Um, and it's free, by the way. You get one free search every month, particularly for um, people who are single. If you know you met somebody and you don't know that much about them yet, or you want to verify what they're telling you is actually accurate. <laughs> uh, yeah. Not that any of us have had experiences with with that happening, but anyway, um, Bin Verified runs a very preliminary background check, and you can find out if people are married when they said that they were not, and things like that. So um, just a reminder, you can um, do certain things with it, but what you want to do is you don't want to overstep the, your authority to use it. So um, you don't want to rely on this for mortgages, credit checks, or insurance. So, so right. it's, a good, it's a good place to start to just sort of like, do I need to dig deeper? Because if you find something there, then it probably is worth it to go and do the more deeper screenings. But if you're not finding anything on Bin Verified, you probably, I don't want to say won't find anything if you dig deeper, but uh, at least it gives you some peace of mind as a starting point. And also just for checking yourself. So. 
So I'm going to try that out. Um, so mine is latergram.me. This is something I have needed, and I, I think a lot of people have needed. It's a way to schedule your Instagram posts. Yes, you can schedule Instagram posts now. So you can schedule them out so that they post on a regular basis. And you don't have to do it. You don't have to make sure that you are constantly updating your Instagram. I think it's great. So is Howard because he was mad that I stole his pick for the week. Yes, this was going to be my pick. <laughs> but check it out. It's later Graham, later than Graham, that me. It's awesome. I really think it's really neat. If there's an Android and iOS app for it as well, try it. It is a freemium model, so if you want to use more features, you have to pay for it, but it's very, very, very well worth it. So check it out. What is Tile, the tileapp.com? All right, Tile. Um, it used to be that this little tile was impossible to get, and now you can actually go to their store and buy them. And what does this do? This actually, through Bluetooth Low Energy, connects with your smartphone. So you can attach it to anything. In this case, I have them attached to my keys. So on the off chance that I can't find my keys, I can go to my mobile app, and then press the little button up here that says, find my keys. And it's going to start making them ring in a second here. Let's see if it does it. Go ahead. Go for it. Hang on. Tap the little button. It's much easier when I click the, then the find button. And then it's going to... It says they're very close. Very, <laughs> very close. <laughs> they're in your hand, you idiot. They're in my hand. So now it's ringing, now that I've hit the button. Well, when I find it, I say done, and it's fine. It says, hey, you got it. But what it's going to tell me, actually, is um, it told me that it was really close. Like, these keys are probably right nearby. They said it's within a meter of you. So you can use it for a wallet. Can you can use it for your wallet. You can put it in a purse. Um, I'm actually, now that you can get these, because I had gotten this, this particular one on its original launch through, I think it was either Indiegogo or Kickstarter, um, I think You're big it, on that stuff, aren't you, Howard? Yeah, I, I do like to look at some of these products, um, but I only got one when I initially ordered it because I didn't want to buy a whole package of them. Now you can get a you can get a package of three for sixty bucks, one for twenty five, I think uh, six for a hundred dollars. Um, but I'm going to put one in my camera bag. I'm going to put one in my laptop bag. Just stuff that's pretty great. Now here's what happens: the moment I lose communication with the tile, no matter what's going on it registers in the app and says, hey, you've lost communication. So it registers the GPS of the last known device of the tile, and if someone finds it, when it touches their networks, it's going to re-register. So if I have one of these inside of my camera bag and someone steals my camera, then at some point, that tile is going to be on a network that it can talk to. And nice. I can, for lack of a better term, get it back without them even knowing that there's some tracking in there. So it's not a GPS tracking, it is Bluetooth low energy, but it does give me some ability to sort of be like, well, this is where I left it, so I have a place to start from there. So that is Tile. It's a pretty cool little uh, cool device. I've actually had one of these for I guess, about eight months now, and it's been perfect. I have not lost my keys. They are still here. Can I put it on my dog and track my dog? You can absolutely put it in your dog and track your dog, and you will see it on a map. It is uh, pretty great. That's what I want. <laughs> That's awesome. So you can find Ruger. Ruger, where are you? Gadget dogs! <laughs> that is exactly. So speaking of that, everyone, please go over to patreon.com slash phillytechorg. If you can give a dollar, give a few dollars a month, every, every little bit helps. So that way we can bring great shows to you like Social Media Addicts, the interview show, we just interviewed Ted Rubin that came out this week. Um, we have you know other shows coming out on a regular basis, the Intergalactic Mobile OS podcast, with me and Howard. Howard and I are going to be doing that. Gadget Dogs with Jody once we get her off the dog show circuit and behind the camera. Well, well that'll happen at some point, I promise. We'll try. Um, the Autism Tech, it's also going to be another great show, so check it out. So, you know, please, patreon.com slash phillytechorg. If you can't give, you know, pass that, you know, help, help, help us promote that link so that people who want to give can give. So thank you all for all that. This is another episode, and we will see you next week. Right, guys? All right. Good night, everyone. See ya. Ta-ta for now. <laughs>